today, any individual has access to information that 20 years ago only the richest billionaire had access to. Seems kind of obvious, right, to this audience of people. And yet the implications for business and business models and what creates power in those business models, it changes everything. So I wanted to spend a little bit of time talking about the business models, what changes, what it means for us as leaders, and what I think people can do, especially some of you who might be going out and maybe starting your own companies post Google, what I think that means for you as entrepreneurs. So the gorillas of the marketplace, the way organizations had power. Here were some of the constructs that they considered. One was that being bigger than everyone else meant that they could have pricing power in the marketplace, meant that they could control which suppliers um, they had access to. It meant that they had this thing called sustainable competitive advantage. Sustainable competitive advantages have now gone from 40 years, long arcs, to 12 years in old industries and five in fast moving industries. So it's really hard to use that term sustainable competitive advantage anymore because it doesn't mean the same thing. Any advantage that an old organization had when they tried to build up a moat around their business actually doesn't hold true. And in fact, the first chapter of Social Era starts with an obituary to this character, traditional strategy. And I basically say it was good while we had you, you had a good life, but you're dead now and we ought to honor the rules of the new era. But gorillas, these big organizations, are actually facing all the changes in the marketplace, whether it was crowdsourcing or SaaS plays or the things that fundamentally lowered the cost structure of having an organization. And they're looking at it and thinking to themselves, all this is really causing me to have to compete against a much leaner organization. And so it's almost like they sit there and they think, how do I go on a diet? But they're missing the fundamental construct that something so big has shifted that it's not just about spandex. You know, um, sorry for such a girl reference there. Uh, <laughs> women wear these things called Spanx. Any of you have ever heard of Spanx? Um, men also have them, but I'd be really scared if one of you guys admitted that you wore Spanx. But um, apparently Roger Moore in the James Bond movies, because he wasn't in good shape, actually wore Spanx. That was the early generation of Spanx. There you go. Um, trivia. So, so, so big organizations are often thinking, you know, of seeing all these things and seeing that they're performing against these lighter based companies and thinking, I've just got to figure out how to do more with less. And I think that's actually a false architecture. Instead, um, I think there's something entirely new coming on and I call that thing the social era. And as I talk about social, most people finish the word social with the word media. So I just want to slow down and say, for me, social is not about media. It's not a marketing or communications thing. And in fact, it might just be helpful to kind of make some distinctions about other key terms that people have used. So um, social media, obviously, was uh, created around the Clue Train Manifesto. It's done a great thing in the world. It's like uh, the Red Bull of organizations, right? So uh, makes you maybe go faster. Uh, accelerate communications and the speed of communication, so it is like Red Bull in that way, but it's, it's still just about communications um, and creating a dialogue versus a monologue. Enterprise 2.0, how many of you guys have heard that term? Oh, not so much this group. So Enterprise 2.0 was coined by Andrew McAfee about six years ago, and the idea was that the tools would allow organizations to function differently. Uh, Peter Kim actually came up with this idea of social business and actually he kind of stole the term from Muhammad Yunus. Muhammad Yunus said, social business, we can actually care about meaning and work. And Peter came, al Kim, came along and said, and he was working at Docus Group at the time, which was a marketing agency, said, you know what, what if we could actually use these tools to actually create wealth and exchange across all the players, so not just shareholders, but customers, communities, so thinking about it that way. But he fundamentally didn't challenge whether or not an organization was still needed. And so in social era, I'm basically saying two things. One is, just to, as a comparison point, in the industrial era, when oil and capital, land, limited resources were at play, then what you needed was an organization that could create scale. And value was fundamentally about what an organization could do and you had to belong within the walls of that organization to create value. Social era, it's exactly the opposite. It starts with a single connected human. Whether or not you belong to an organization or work for an organization, pretty much a secondary effect. And so what that changes is why are we all together? And if there's all those people out there who could be creating value with us, how do we engage that? So that's the institutional view. 
And then at an individual level, it changes because we get to start thinking about ourselves, not just am I an employee of such and such, but what is this unit of value creation that I bring? And where do I want to plug that unit, such a mechanical term, unit into? You know, if I'm a Lego block, what other Lego blocks do I want to go join with so I can start creating value and build from there? The shift changes how we think about leadership, how we think about business models, how we think about even just when we think about scaling, what is scaling? So I'll give you a couple examples of how that comes to play. Singularity University, how many of you guys know Singularity? Because it's here in the valley, there you go, big group. Um, aimed at people who have already gotten graduate degrees, but who fundamentally want to change the world. And their idea was, instead of teaching people backward looking information, let's teach them forward looking information, because if they're gonna be true change agents in the world, they need that. But that changes really often. What is new and current three years ago is not as new and current today. And so you have to build an organizational construct that's fundamentally designed for speed, for that kind of flexibility. So they deliver almost 400 hours of curriculum with seven full-time staff. That seven full-time staff basically hold the mission of the organization, and then they recruit the next group. The next group, that sort of 10 thought leaders across robotics and biomedical stuff and so on, tissue engineering, really you know, innovative stuff. Um, that 10 people then go find the next 20 people who are the leaders in the field. 20 people can happen from anywhere. So inherently global, inherently social, using collaborative technologies to bring them all together. No one needs to be in one particular place. They come in, they deliver their piece of value, they leave again. At the end of every semester, it collapses all back down. So you sit there and you go, what do we need to, sell? You know, what do we need to actually deliver next semester? Change is built into the organizational design. Change is built into how they even think about things. So it's not how do we protect and maintain tenured staff or these buildings, right? But what, do we, what is it we really want to be called to do? And then what is the way in which we'll modularly figure out who needs to belong as part of our tribe? Those people certainly are affiliated with Singularity University in the sense of some of the best thought leaders in the world come and teach there. They don't work for that institution. And the institution gets to get value from that exchange. TED. Probably everyone in this group has watched the TED video. Yes? Yeah. So TED actually started off as a really elite conference, originally one, now two, where just a couple, maybe like a thousand people participated. And as those um, people came together, they would come and they'd be influential and stuff, but then they'd leave and, and four years ago or so they said, you know, maybe we should share the talks that they're happening, we should share them online. So they started doing something with YouTube to share videos as they were being created by the conference, which upped the production level and focused all that, which was good, sharing free, good. But the thing that really made TED more powerful is they figured out there were actually some people that might want to create TED conferences too, TEDx's. And so they created this little sub-brand, and, and, and to hear them tell the story is they thought maybe five, maybe 10 people might be interested in doing these things because of course it'll take a lot of work. You have to curate all the speakers, you have to be really attentive to uh, holding an event. There's just a ton of details to manage, so you know, five, maybe 10. Since then, three years later, 5,000 events have happened around the world. 22,000 hours of content <laughs> has been created in the process. And about 220 of those talks have been posted on TED.com. So TED has figured out how to create scale. TED.com being incredibly inclusive, I mean exclusive, right? Very, very small staff of people curate what goes on TED.com. TED conferences being semi-open in that you have to apply and be relatively rich to get in. And then TEDx open to all people who want to both create the event as well as people who want to attend an event. Scale. If you tried to do that with a budget, just think about a traditional organization like GE or, I don't know, uh, Xerox, the idea of TEDx just kind of, they kind of they're baffled by it because they, they think we should do it. And so scale for them is much more about we hire the people, we have the buildings, we have the staff, right? So that's the gorilla mentality. And of course, the opposite is TEDx. It's gazelles. It's how 800 unique parties are getting together and figuring out how to create value. And of course, uh, since TEDx has started, they've, 
they've had all these beautiful events all over the year. Bernie Brown is the speaker in the middle, and she now has 10 million views on a talk she gave at TEDx Houston. These really flexible constructs can apply to every part of a business. And for most traditional organizations, they actually don't see that. And so that's one of the reasons I created this table. But in HR, the Singularity University example shows that you don't have to have employees creating value. In service, it used to be that you used to have call centers, and those people worked for you, even if they were outsourced to a different country. And McAfee Mavens or Intuit accountants are two examples where communities of people actually provide peer-to-peer -peer support. Intuit accountants now answer 74% of all the questions peer-to-peer. And uh, the staff has really uh, gotten a chance to step back. But what's more interesting, right, is that the community of people is actually adding value onto that platform. Capitalization, everyone in this room has probably heard about Kickstarter and all the various ways in which you can fund something. But people aren't just giving money. They're actually showing an investment in the person, right? It's a community. And the way that they're putting a dollar into that system actually changes how committed they are to that act. Um, the purse, I just invest in Everpurse. Everpurse, is that right? Yeah, that's right. So it charges a phone up. Woman, entrepreneur, women get less than 3% of all venture fundings. And so her chance of getting access to capital on her own, pretty low, right? Just if you think about the stats on that. But here she is, she went out to the community and she figured out how to change the phone charging process. So if you are out for a day, your phone will almost always run out. But this purse, as you put the phone back in the purse, actually charges the purse. You have a secondary uh, recharge unit basically available to you at all times. Worth investing in because it's just a, such a creative idea. And of course, now has raised, I think she's up to $2 million and, and the product's going into production. Product used to be about we make it once and sell it many times. And all the examples online are about whether it's Etsy or, uh, uh, gosh, what's the t-shirt company? Threadless, which I remember a couple years ago I was obsessed with. Uh, all different ways in which we can create custom production. Desktop factory, which actually allows you to do 3D printing. I, I love it. Somebody sent in a picture of a dog, and they built a little miniature dog. And I'm like, how interesting. One day you could actually build like a real big size dog, right? But there's, there's just so many ways in which the product is not a product. It's our product. It's a thing we care about so much that the value proposition changes. Because it's not just about a thing somebody else has made. It's about a thing we've made together. And when you've made something together, you're not selling it. You don't have to sell the thing you've made together. Distribution, certainly Amazon to Etsy, tons of examples of open marketplaces changing distribution. Supply chain, how many of you guys use Lego Factory when they were doing the custom stuff? Anybody? What'd you build? Um, we just built more Star Wars stuff. Oh, more Star Wars stuff, okay. And what'd you build? Public telescope. A public telescope? So how wow, you're kidding. Yeah. <laughs> you can, it, it used to be a data set back in the 70s, and it was discontinued. Oh, sorry, in the 80s, and then it was discontinued. So, so you did, there you go. So people have sent in houses, and you, know, you can build anything. And for a long time, people were actually sending in pictures of their kids. I mean, just it's, it's, you know, because it's really a way for you to not just have a Lego set, it's to have your Lego set. Sales. Sales used to be back, I'm kind of going to date myself when I tell the story, but back when I was at Apple. You used to have to sign a contract with these people called retailers in order for them to carry your product. And your job was to figure out how to give them enough money so they wouldn't carry anybody else's product. And it was all this set of monetization plays. And Evernote, as just one example, gives away their product. Gosh, where am I standing right now? Gives away their product knowing that enough people use them, you can monetize it in many other ways. And then, of course, we talked about the TED to TEDx example, which a marketing budget could not nearly do in the same way. They've created scale, and they've created enthusiasm, and they've created influencers. Every part of the business model is affected when you can allow community to actually co-create with you. They don't work for you. You don't tell them what to do. But this stuff happens. And in fact, when I, when I tell this idea to, to you know, like more traditional business leaders, just because I have that background, they will look at me like, that's just super scary. Is it scary for any of you? OK. Well, no, apparently. OK, how is it scary? How do you maintain quality? How do you maintain quality? That's a great question. Do you have one, too? Like, negative of the brand, where it's more into like a social mesh rather than being within the brand owners of that organization. Right. How do you own the brand? That's super scary. In fact, I I'm going to step away from the slides for a second and tell you the story of Ted. So, TED, with its now 5,000 events, around uh, December last year, some people in Spain produced a TEDx, 
TEDx Valencia, I think it was. And they had people who, uh, I'm trying really hard not to make fun of it. Uh, my face is going to give it away, though. Um, plus, oh, God, what was the word? Plasticity. They came up with this word that didn't mean anything, and then they had some person who who understood the psychic healing power of crystals. And they had so these pretty non-scientific people positioning all their stuff as scientific stuff. And somebody ended up writing a post who witnessed it and said this was an offense on so many levels. Like it was an offense to science. It was an offense to the people who had to witness it. It was an offense to Ted. It was just an offense to oh, and I think the last line was and to common sense because it was just you know, it's ridiculous. And uh, so here, uh, many, many miles away, right, happening in a different language. And somebody on Reddit uh, ends up posting in the Spanish, originally in the Spanish thing, and posting it on Reddit saying, Ted's name is being dragged through the mud. 5,000 people comment on it within 24 hours. goes all over Twitter and all the logical places. And uh, Ted starts stepping into the fray. And first they say, uh, you know, this is, people are allowed to have their own stuff and, you know, that sometimes happens and we'll manage it later and yada yada. And then what happens in this dialogue though, because it's not just a one-way thing, is they use it to learn. And somebody says, you know what, you're not giving your people enough guidance as to how to pick speakers. And so a bunch of your content is pseudoscience crap. In fact, there's one that's beautiful. If you go on Quora, um, there's somebody who's actually posted a TED Talk and says, how long can you get through this talk without wanting to throw up? And it's a, a physicist over at Stanford that says, not long, you know, and, 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 and just debunks the, the talk. That talk has since been removed. The thing that Ted had to do was to step into the dialogue and figure out what is it they could learn. And then they actually ended up posting like a multi-page kind of process, like people, we got to fix this. And this is not our problem, Ted. This is our problem. Ted. And they actually asked the community to step into the fray more, like step up how much you're curating, step up how you're doing it. And so certainly there's a risk in all of that stuff that's happened, but what they've actually said is openness wins overall. And But we have to make, as much as we make these people part of our co-creative process, they are also part of the solution. So in the problem is a solution. And they ended up posting a whole series of things and, and working through that. And, and I think it's just terrifying for anyone who owns a brand because your brand can be dragged through the mud. And of course, there's a the whole control issue about how do you manage quality. And in Ted's case, one of the ways they manage quality is to say, this section of it is free. 1,000 flowers bloom. And this section we highly curate, ted.com. And so how do you allow, because the brand is so indistinct to some people, right? how do you do both and make sure you're managing your quality? So I hope I answered both those two um, concerns. But I think it's, it's scary on multiple levels than just the one, you know, ones that you've mentioned. It's when you're leading a leaderless context, how do you do that? And if you went to business school like I did, they, the, the way we're taught leadership is you're in charge. And it's about how much you're leading people or resources. And power comes from leading people and resources, not about whether or not you're leading an idea. And that's the fundamental shift here that we're talking about is Ted's leading an idea. And so are a whole bunch of other organizations. There's a question. Yeah. Um, Ted is obviously a great example, but the, the reason why, Ted, why people want to help Ted is yeah. because Ted is a very strong brand. Yes. Um, As is good. However, if I would start Zed, I don't think I would get the same following. It really has to do once you're already a success. I mean, Ted is. Um, people are willing to invest time into helping, helping them. Also because in their own self-interest that they want to become part of that success. So you're raising a really good point, which is how do you get people to run with you? And so in Ted's case, they had enough of a magnetic pull. But in other cases, it's figuring out how do you have shared interests? So in, in Ted's case, they're actually doing this thing where people who want to bring ideas to market use the master brand of Ted and are able to invest literally hundreds of hours in order to do that. The question is, why are all those people doing it? And how do you really tap into that? Kickstarter has started, you know, it's only three years old. It's kind of hard to imagine that because it's had such a profound effect. But what it's tapping into is this desire that's beyond money about how can I commit to certain things? And what is this shared product I might want to bring into this market or this shared purpose I might have with someone? And that starts to create the magnet. And so instead of thinking about how do I tell other people, it's what's that magnetic force of purpose and how do I get it to be so darn strong 
that they'll come. And once you tap into that, you start tapping into a different source, a creative source. It causes people to run with you using the visual behind me. And that's, that's what I'm trying to talk to is the shift used to be that you used to do stuff by yourself, alone, apart, and power came from the value chain kind of process of being distinctly apart. And then the other one is about community, which is how do I get a bunch of people to start working in collaboration? And that shifts scale, right? But it also means that from a marketing perspective, you're no longer just talking about a product. So just take 20 years ago, we take it for granted today, but 20 years ago, the power of being able to sell a product was how big a megaphone you could have. And that share of voice, as it was called in the marketplace, allowed you to dominate how much you could then exclude other people. Hmm, that's not really, you know, not the case anymore, right? So what causes people to then be pulled into the story with you is about purpose. And who can join with you in that endeavor? In the TED example, it's really easy to see the shared purpose is we get to create content and ideas that matter. But what is the shared purpose? Let's, let's take Google Plus. Why does someone invest in Google Plus versus, let's say, Facebook? Anybody have a take on that? I'd say one that I hear a lot from our users is that there's a level of authenticity, that they can be contextual, that they can, instead of putting on a persona and sort of status casting the glamour of their life, they can have authentic, meaningful conversations in the safe context of the people that they actually want to talk to for a given topic. So the circles kind of construct circles, allows right. you to actually say, here's who I want to talk to about this thing. Right. Yeah. So it creates more meaning. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So meaning, instead of just broad, exactly. is what creates a difference. Any other yeah. thoughts on why someone would choose Google Plus over Facebook? Why would someone go spend the time, energy time, shifting their protocols from Facebook, and I just think it's a more dominant today, so I'll just use that as the example, to Google Plus? You want to have a personal persona, you might want to have use Facebook, but have a professional persona. You know, so, so, so I don't think you did some either or. So I, I use Google Plus uh, as sort of a, my my professional persona, hmm. and Facebook is where all my aunts and uncles are. Or your old high school buddies, yeah. right? Yeah. Which I'm, I'm sort of amazed that all these high school buddies exist, because they didn't talk to me in high school. You know, I don't understand why they talk to me now. If you help me manage my presence more, um, then all of a sudden I have more vested interests. In it, I think the circles thing is profound in terms of how I manage what I want to share. So I am a grandma in addition to being an author, in addition to I have a ton of questions of things that sometimes I don't really want to ask to a really broad group, I just want to ask to a really small group because I'm actually testing an idea and I want to see just how crazy it is. And I don't want to necessarily broadcast that sometimes I'm just really testing an early idea. Um, so there's those other levels of communication that I'm managing which Facebook doesn't allow me to manage. And I could do something like what you're suggesting which is I can use Facebook for one thing and Twitter for another thing. But I think what's happening is attention, which is the currency of the social era, is being depleted. And as long as I'm doing literally LinkedIn, don't forget those guys, LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter, Google+, Plus, oh my god, I could spend a day, right? And, uh, and so I think there's, there's something there about what is the purpose, and I think as all this attention continues to get diverged, I think the opportunity to come back together and manage in one spot is going to become more interesting. So I, I think that's going to become especially interesting to those of us that are deluged. And we'll be the ones who will go to a new platform. So that's just a thesis. I have, I could be completely wrong. That's one of my early thesis, right? But what I'm saying is if you can figure out what's that purpose of what problem could you solve for someone like me who, you know, is pretty active online, you might actually be able to also create a, a domino effect for other people. And it's when you start thinking about that, you start to change how you think about messaging. It's tying back to what's the fundamental need. And I know that's probably incredibly obvious to this audience, and I'm just pointing out that it's not obvious to a lot of marketeers. That we think first about what is the product I have, and how do I blast it out. And if, if you're any, I still am kind of amazed at how much press releases still manage to come in my inbox, even though I keep tagging it as spam, because I'm like, really, people? If, I, if it's important, I'll find out about it on my own. Like, don't tell me. I don't want to know from you. I want to know from a different context, right? So those two shifts, though, changed the business model piece, which is how we started, right? So we said that 800-pound gorilla that had power by having power over other people, by having a bunch of people work for them, by locking up capital, by locking up resources, by having more capital to be able to shout that megaphone to the world, that guy's been sitting around thinking about, guy, sorry, 
but it is, um, has been thinking about the diet. Like, how do I get myself to just act leaner? And he should be thinking about how do I act more gazelle-like? Because the architecture that they've been using is I make a lot of stuff and I sell a lot of it and that's how I get to have scale. That's how I become successful. That is an architecture of 1970 of a company Purina Dog Chow might include. Sorry, that's a personal reference he said to me a long time ago. And those guerrilla constructs are no longer valid. But that is largely the constructs that are taught in business school today. And they're essentially eliminating or not seeing this other set of apertures. So I just want to expand the framework of how we might think about business models in the future. The first is thinking about scale not as an axis about just the stuff I do alone and separate, but the stuff I do with others. That is so fundamental, a tectonic shift. And this group might take it for granted, but the broader world does not. And business models don't play to that. And the second is to think about not just what we produce, but what is the way in which we engage other people in that purpose because that changes things. And just to kind of make it a little bit more real, I'm going to overlay the examples. So of course the quadrants start to create meaning. One has more about meaning, about meaning, one about communities, one about co-creation. But as you see the examples, you can start to see how that plays out. Zipcar, Avis did not create Zipcar, Avis had to buy Zipcar, right? Why? Because they considered that idea about Sharing, stewardship, ugh. Like that just wouldn't occur to them. It wasn't part of their business model, right? How do we make money as Avis? Three years ago it was about I have enough cars, I have a fleet of cars and assets, and I have enough scale so I can reach all the spots in which you need the cars. So the idea of this decentralized kind of construct or actually not owning a resource in the same way, having importance, dismissed it. In fact, it's kind of easier to see this example when I do the banking one. So Bank of America, uh, for years, uh, missed the opportunity to actually do any kind of micro lending, which is what Kiva really created six, seven years ago. Micro lending, which allows me to give $25, but that $25 largely to be circulated and improve the economy in developing areas. They actually spent $2, two million finding a company called ProFounder, which allowed someone like me, if I wanted, if you were a local dry cleaner and I wanted to help you go green, I could invest in it but actually get paid back. So in a traditional world of lawyers, it costs over $100,000 for that transaction to happen. And ProFounder found a way to do it for $1,000. Pretty incredible business model. Allows capital to come from many sources, allows it to be paid back. So instead of buying ProFounder, they spent $2 million and several years of legislation putting ProFounder out of business. Yeah. I was one of the early investors in ProFounder, so just so I'm being full disclosure. But the reason I really thought they were important is because I thought they let a different kind of community construct really come into play. And then, of course, they skip things like PayPal and Square because they're like, yeah, yeah, those little small merchants, they're, little, they're too small for us to care about. And we're going to charge them more because they're more high risk. And yet, anyone who's gone to a hairdresser and who's done a Square exchange, I have more community with that Square exchange person then I do that merchant at Lenardi's, right? It's, it changes the relationship. They're actually less risky because we know each other. We're going we're gonna to be in the same park together later that day. The banking industry, like any big industry, has basically been saying, yeah, yeah, those other quadrants, yeah, yeah, they don't, they don't matter. Community, no. So they're actually really struggling with this. But until we understand business models that apply to all four constructs, we will not expand our universe. We will not expand how value creation actually happens. And I just want to double click down on this notion of purpose because sometimes I, I do a talk like this. People nod their head around purpose and then uh, we walk out of the room and it turns out we're not defining it the same way. So I'm just going to take you know, five minutes and I'm going to open up for questions on that. Purpose is really about the why. But I'll give you a couple examples. So how many of you guys have gone to sports authority? You notice that no one in there actually does sports? No? Noticed? How, and so usually that gets a big laugh, so I'm, just, I'm like curious. Uh, you guys actually think they know sports? So in Sports Authority, they hire a cashier person or they hire someone to do stocking or someone to, but people don't actually love the sports. And in comparison, when you go to REI, people actually love the sport. And they will literally walk you over from a backpack area to the map area and say, where are you thinking about going? Let's make sure you get the right map. And by the way, instead of buying that product, because that's kind of expensive, if, you're, if this is your first time out, you might want to rent it because it's a lot cheaper. 
they will actually get you enthusiastic about sports. Difference between sports authority, oh, sorry, I just clicked capacity things, um, and REI. Okay, so apparently that build wasn't gonna well build. But the difference, right, is about purpose. So when you're REI, you're actually hiring talent based on that purpose, that passion that that person brings in to the organization. And that's what allows them to show up fully alive at work and engage with consumers the way they do. So it's a way for us to actually think about who do we put on our team. RIM to Apple, so RIM many years ago, and then of course you guys extend the story so, and uh, to other audiences. By the way, I talk about Google quite a bit, so I'm just avoiding doing it here. Um, why would you tell the same story to a group that already knows it? RIM, three, four years ago, focused on creating the developer app and actually picked, they felt like their job was to pick what was the application that should be on the device. And then Apple came along and said, gosh, that's costing, first of all, a lot of money, and why should we be the ones to pick? And they just figured out how to change the fundamental cost system of developing an app from a million dollars to $10,000. Google came along and did it to $1,000. Thousand flowers blooming. Why should we pick? And that open model, RIM is certainly closed, Apple is semi-open, Google fully open. Google now has 50% of market share of the mobile space in less than three years. Apple earns only 4% of its sales from the App Store, but of course, what would be Apple without the App Store? And of course, RIM, you know the demise of RIM, so that story kind of plays itself out. Purpose then lets somebody own that device and really think about it as their device. So the silly things I might do with mine is gonna be different than the thing you would do with yours, right? And how we all geek out on our own device. It personalizes it, both in terms of what we produce and then how we actually consume content. And of course, it shows up in the ways we think about products. Years ago, my husband drove home with a, a, a white Prius and um, I had no idea he was gonna buy a Prius that day, but he showed home, you know, like, okay, and I'm like, why? It's not, that's not a car, that is not a car. That is a transportation pod. And so I was sort of like, why would you do that? Why would you trade a perfectly nice BMW in for like a thing that's not even fun to drive? And the thing that I didn't get at the time was how much my husband valued the earth more than he valued a car. But if you had gone to General Motors or any major company, they would have thought about a car as having more, uh, the best car in the world, having better luxury seats or better heat, better stability on the road. And they would have kept building a bigger and bigger car, which explains the SUV market, right? Luxury. But what they didn't account for is the set of values that someone can hold that actually allows them to take trade-offs in the marketplace. So for them, the optimal car is not the most luxurious car. The optimal car is the car that is best on the earth, set of values. GM actually caught on to that just about recently. <laughs> but it's because they didn't see outside their world. They didn't have a shared purpose with the consumer. It was them making a product and selling it out. So as soon as you step into the shared space, the commons, outside the perimeter of your walls, you start really creating products quite differently. And it becomes an alignment tool for within the enterprise and then external to the enterprise. How do you get that herd of people to come work with you? It's figuring out what is that purpose that so magnetically draws them in that they're willing to work sometimes for free in the dead case, right? Hundreds of hours to work for free and to come create with you because you found something quite appealing for them to join in on. So I'll take questions because um, uh, we have a moment, I think. We have a moment? We're good? to take questions. Yes. Start with the first question. Shoot. So. He got the mic. How uh, do you do that? Wow, that's So, good. thank you for the presentation. That's a really cool insight. But the thing that was keeping into my mind that yes. it's a lot of US and Western mm -hmm. type of insights. So there is a billion in China, a billion in India, and another billion in the rest of Asia. Yeah. That type of a change will happen in the longer, longer will. future. Of course it will. How can we anticipate like the starter spark? How can we be ready, be ready as Google and then as individuals who might go in for startups to like, hey, we're gonna be the next PayPal of China and the next um, Tesla cars for like India and things like that. Yeah. Those countries still do not have the same problems or even care about the same things that a US or a Western type of citizen would care about. Well, I think one of the things that you guys often do and I, and I think I just saw it got announced today is you announce uh, opportunities for people to start creating value and change the world in their own way. And you guys just announced Google X, what'd you call it, X Vision? Solve for X, thank you. Um, uh, it's figuring out how to use openness as an asset so that you're not even defining what the problem is or the solution. 
and, and how do you build your entire technology system so that you don't have to own the outcome of it, but allowing many, many voices to play, bringing whatever unique perspective they have from around the world, right? Um, I, I told the story at lunch, so I'll, but I'll repeat it because I just think it's a great story. There was a program called Foldit. Do you know of Foldit? Protein folding uh, crowdsourced application. And uh, when they first started it, they had this very strong preconception of who would end up contributing. And so their fundamental thesis was, well, we're really like bright MIT people, and we'll have other people, but from other countries, uh, participate. And so we'll get the best of India and the best of China to participate and so on. But in their head, the preconception was it's going to look a lot and feel a lot like who they were, but just in another region. And the person who ended up becoming the best protein folder in the world, which is, a, if you know this, you actually can accelerate science research. So it's incredibly important. The breast protein folder in the world, anyone know the answer? It was a woman, an admin during the day, a nurse by training in Manchester. Sort of the opposite of what they were thinking, right? But because the openness of the architecture, instead of holding on to the outcome, the openness of the architecture allowed a lot of difference to show up in the system and allowed the very best qualified person to win. And that's actually, to me, the fundamental twist in the social era. If before it was about picking and vetting and choosing and building an empire, this is just the opposite, which is, how do I not pick? How do I not vet? How do I actually encourage anyone anywhere to contribute? It's not that everyone will, but that anyone can. And then all of a sudden, you open up a global economy. Um, very interesting talk. Um, it seems like the, um, the purpose area is, is, is a problematic area in some sense, um, in that um, by defining purpose, that, that there's um, almost like marketing. You only have a certain appetite for, for purpose. Um, and so how does Kellogg's cereal alongside toothpaste, alongside, you know, like the, the wide kind of panoply of products, how, how do you establish purpose and actually allow consumers not to become fatigued? I'm not sure Kellogg's or a thing applies to that, just so, you know, but I think it's figuring out what is, what is in the commons that are unsolved problems. That's how I'm really starting to think about purpose, right? So for a minute, I think people know how to get breakfast. So for a moment, I'm going to park that sucker. Um, although healthy breakfast could certainly own a... A category because it's hard. Um, but it's figuring out what is this thing in the commons that's unseen that if I step out there I can start to figure out what are unsolved things and then how do we own it. IBM did it a couple years ago when um, probably one of the best companies that's done this is they had a uh, what would you call it a brain jam I think is what their term was for it a couple years back and they said we know we should be doing more in the green space we honestly don't know what that's exactly how they said it we don't know what it is. We don't know what it is we could add value to. We don't know who we should work with. Maybe you guys could come help us shape that. And that has become, the, that genesis now three or four years later uh, is contributing about 5.5% of their gross revenue in this notion of smarter planet and a series of product lines around it. But what they did is they asked people to actually just come into the space with them and said, anybody want to help shape how IBM does more green? So in that case, they didn't own even what it is they should do or how they should deliver it, but they stepped into the uncertainty of the space. And they could have looked like fools. They, they you know, look back at that like, wow, that could have gone badly. Um, but they just really did a discernment process with other people, with curiosity, inviting people to come play with them. And I think that gives us a genesis of even just saying, what is an unsolved problem? And then how do you magnetically start attracting people to come help you even define that problem? I think it's quite attractive. As you're talking about scale, it reminds me of, so I work on the Google product form, so it's like our, our help forms for Google products. And the way that we've always thought about improving that product is how to scale it better, mm. in this, kind of in the same sense as what TED is doing. Like they want users to generate the content. We want users to be our helpers instead of, you know, having Google invest in one-to-one -one support for our consumer products, which is, you know, not possible. So one thing I wanted to ask you about is how you create purpose when your product is already set, your mission is already set. Mm. How do you create a purpose that's beneficial to the user, also beneficial to Google, um, out of a circumstance that's already kind of created for you? Why don't you ask them? Ask the user? Ask the user. Like, so, so here's the thing, right, is I think sometimes we want to know the answer before we answer the question kind of thing. And then, but in the case of Intuit, I'll just use that as another example, they actually opened up to their own accounting team 
you know, all the people who use their platform, is there any way you guys could be more interactive that we could help with? And what it turns out is people in Idaho really don't understand the tax rules in California and vice versa and stuff. And they said, if you could just let us have online forms and make sure nothing illegal happens here and manage the sort of, you know, the tension there so that crazy stuff doesn't happen, you'd actually have created something incredibly valuable for us. And they solved that problem themselves. And then the, the community starts to step back. And of course, then they also take over answering the, what I'll call dumb questions for a second. They also take over answering the dumb questions because while I'm here and I'm talking to you about these other harder problems, I'll give a few minutes here, right? The exchange starts to become valuable uh, because neither side is depleted. That's the, that's the very definition of the social era is in the exchange, neither side is depleted. So TED and TEDx both benefit. There's something in the common that they're building together. It's not an exchange where I pay you or you pay me and then each one goes their own separate ways or I take advantage of you. The very definition of social means you get to solve something together. So if you don't know the answer to it, I think the answer becomes how do you ask the question well? To say, we'd love to think about more ways um, for us to have more scale, for us to step back and maybe add more value in the process. What could that be? And you may find no answers. And you might look silly for a few minutes. But that's probably the worst thing that's going to happen. And then, but what might happen is some creative answers. So it starts reformulating the question. In, in this questions where we're crowdsourcing, does it go to the other extreme? Like you buy something from Amazon, now they're completely peppering you for reviews <laughs> on every item that you've bought. Um, yeah. And uh, you yeah. know, it's like listening to NPR. There are those weeks where you have to listen even if you've contributed yeah. and put in that, yeah. and invest in it. Uh, you know, when does it become too much where you're starting to crowdsource and everybody's doing the same thing and you're hitting the same audience multiple times, right? So this whole thing is becoming about attention. Attention is a currency of the social era. The more you can get someone a higher return for their currency of attention, they're going to gravitate to you. I think Facebook, for example, is actually coming at too high a cost. I think it's actually at a, a tipping point in one direction. I think it's really about currency. So Amazon doing that behavior makes me want to shop less at Amazon, right? And I'm like one of their like big, I know, big customers, right? I'm just really clear about that. And they're just driving me so nuts that I'm actually sitting here thinking, okay, now you've made it where I no longer want to interact with you. Because there's no preference setting I can do to turn that little sucker off. They're making it possible for someone else to enter the space. Think about what you're doing as managing attention. And then think about in that exchange, are you making it equal? That exchange about getting a ping back is helping Amazon, it's not helping me. And they've now created a cost for me to interact, right? They've changed the currency exchange. So just, I think that becomes a really interesting metric as we go forward, how to look at that. And I know you had a, was, did I answer your question? Okay, thank you. So um, this strategy of going to the user community and asking for help and collaboratively solving problems, does that strategy still work when the problem you're trying to solve is bad actors in the community? Um, so does it solve the problem when there's bad actors? I think it does. Okay. And um, I, so I happen to have a Harvard Magazine piece coming out on this TED debacle, which was just brutal. You know, I'm not sure how much you were nodding your head when I talked about Reddit. Did you see it? Yeah. So one of the things that they actually just said in the interview process, you know, because I was I was trying to um, get this article to be really as tight as possible, and so I asked them, you know, how do you think about this? How do you how do you think about the management part of this? And they said, listen, it's not us managing. It's not me going out there and saying no, no, no. It's figuring out how to raise the bar and standard where they tell each other. You should not have, no, you should not be a TEDx licensee, no. No, not that person, right? And you, and it finds a way to filter out. It's, it's a very similar system to what eBay created when the first transactions happened. How do you build more trust in the system? Because social error is all about relationships. So relationships are the way in which we're going to measure it. Trust is an outcome of a relationship. How do you build up trust? So they've got to figure out how to build more metrics into the system, feedback loop, back to Ted saying these people did not put on a good event, et cetera, so the license does not get renewed. So the system becomes reinforcing, and peer reviews end up really shaping that. So there are ways to do it, but they have to think about it not as them telling, or them directing, or them even being in charge. Because the way to do a community is to have the community police. Okay, so you're not, you're, you're not, you're not saying that 
in the in the face of a lot of bad actors, you still need the gatekeeper to take a role. You're saying that that's still a solvable problem with, with the community. Mostly, and then I think I think as it bubbles up, like they the guy who did the vortex mathematics talk, which is the one I kind of mentioned around the Quora. It's, it's a crazy talk. If, if you can actually still find it somewhere online, it's really funny to watch because the guy is just doing buzzword bingo as fast as he possibly can. It's a hilarious talk, in a certain way because like you're like, what's he doing? You know. Um, so my opening. Uh, line of my Harvard Magazine article is what fucking bullshit because I'm quoting the professor who's like commenting on the talk so I feel pretty good that I managed to start a Harvard Magazine article with what fucking bullshit because um, try sneaking that in you know um, but uh, but what that ends up becoming is peer review raises an issue and then of course there's a judgment call so it never eliminates the role of the the central body because there's if you still want to manage that but you can get like 99% of it to happen out here and you want accountability because this is all about an exchange. So you can't, you can't sort of hold on to the accountability and expect people to feel ownership. You, it works inside an organization. It works external. The more you give people power, the more they end up creating and bringing their fullest selves to work. Right? So you want everything like that. You want to figure out, how do I assign this thing that might be in my head as far away as, from me as possible so the thing that really matters is managed and everything else can be their own source of creativity? Did I answer the question? Well, thank you so much, thank Nafa, you, for coming in. Um, it's been a really interesting chat. And um, we're going to post this talk online as well um, on the Authors at channel. So thanks, everyone, for coming and dialing in. Bye.